Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine. Today, I'm discussing transient global amnesia. To start off, what is it? It's the acute onset of anterior grade amnesia and disorientation without other neurologic findings and which self-resolves within a day. Let's dive into the clinical presentation in a bit more detail. The hallmark is the aforementioned anterior grade amnesia, which refers to the inability to form new memories. So every few minutes, the affected patient forgets where they are and what's happening. This results in the patient being disoriented to time, place, and situation. They often display perseveration by repeating the same question over and over, such as, what time is it? Seemingly unaware that the, their question has been answered multiple times before. This perseveration can be extreme, with the same question asked literally hundreds of times over a few hours. Although it's always the anterior grade amnesia that's most prominent, there is also a variable degree of retrograde amnesia, which, uh, in which some patients seem to have forgotten events that, ha that occurred in the days to weeks prior to the onset of the TGA episode. A minority of patients report other symptoms, such as a headache, nausea, and or anxiety. Aside from memory problems, most other cognitive function remains intact. This includes the patient's level of consciousness. Patients remain oriented to self, meaning that they know who they are, and basic family relationships and friends. They remember their occupation and their hobbies and interests. This orientation to self virtually rules out the diagnosis. What is known as immediate recall is intact, which is most often tested by listing a short series of seemingly random digits and asking the patient to immediately repeat them back. Speech and language remain intact, as does motor memory, such as the ability to play a mu uh, musical instrument or a particular sport with which they are already familiar. Most patients are older than 50 years of age. That's not to say that it can't happen at a younger age, but the younger the patient, the more the clinician should look for an alternative explanation. Some episodes appear to have an identifiable trigger. These include acute emotional trauma, strenuous activity, sexual intercourse, a valsalva maneuver such as straining with a bowel movement, intense pain, high altitude, a plunge in cold water, or a medical procedure such as endoscopy or angiography. Regarding the duration of episodes, from their onset to the full resolution of overt symptoms, the mean duration is 6 hours, and they are almost always less than 12. By definition, episodes of TGA do not last longer than 24 hours. The end of an episode is gradual over minutes to hours rather than an abrupt transition. After full resolution, patients typically have no memory of the episode itself other than a vague uh, sense of something strange having, having happened to them. What is the pathogenesis of TGA? When I was a young attending physician and I first encountered a patient with this condition, I had not previously heard of it and it seemed so strange that I thought it must be psychiatric in origin or maybe even malingering. But the strong consensus is that it is not psychiatric, or at least not psychiatric in the majority of those affected. Based on the symptoms, the dysfunction is presumably originating from within the medial temporal lobe, within which memory function is normally located. The specific mechanism of dysfunction is not known, but hypotheses include arterial ischemia, focal seizure, venous congestion, and a migranous phenomenon. And in a minority of patients, there may be a psychiatric component. Regarding how clinicians make a diagnosis of TGA, it is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that there are no confirmatory diagnostic tests, and thus it can only be diagnosed by ruling out conditions with similar presentations. For example, aside from impaired memory, the physical exam is otherwise normal. Labs are normal. Conventional neuroimaging, including CT and basic MRI, are normal. However, diffusion-weighted MRI that is performed at least 12 hours after the onset of symptoms may show one or more small punctate lesions within one or both hippocampi. 
symptoms are almost always resolved by the time these MRI findings become visible, leading to a legitimate discussion as to whether it's a cost-effective test to order. This brings me to the differential diagnosis of TGA, that is, the list of medical conditions which can have similar presentations. As a general rule, for clinicians familiar with the diagnosis and experience in seeing it, diagnosis is not difficult. But for clinicians relatively unfamiliar with it, there are a number of diagnoses with which it can be mistaken. Delirium of any cause, a transient ischemic attack or stroke, drug intoxication, of which the most common culprits for this type of presentation would include alcohol, hypnotics such as benzodiazepines, the non-benzodiazepine sleep aids like Ambien and Lunesta, and gabapentin. Another drug to consider is gamma-hydroxybutyric acid, or GHB, also known as the date rape drug. Seizure, either a non-convulsive seizure directly affecting the medial temporal lobe, or as a manifestation of post-ictal confusion following an unwitnessed convulsive seizure. Other conditions on the differential include complex migraine, hypoglycemia, and dissociative amnesia. Regarding this last condition, in contrast to transient global amnesia, dissociative amnesia results in prominent retrograde amnesia in which someone forgets who they are, and they may wander around for days or weeks, leading to a missing person investigation and eventually ending up in unexpected locations. Behavior and a time course that is not consistent with TGA. In contrast to TGA, dissociative amnesia is more typically psychiatric in origin. Moving on to treatment, episodes of TGA are self-limited and no treatment is necessary. In particular, if the patient's symptoms seem to warrant psychiatric medication, such as antipsychotics, the diagnosis is probably wrong. While by definition patients recover spontaneously, there is mixed data as to whether or not patients have lingering subclinical neurocognitive deficits and whether they have higher rates of subsequently developing dementia. Most patients do not experience a recurrence of the episode. The occurrence of more than three episodes should prompt a search of an alternative diagnosis.